Welcome to the void. It is an uncomfortable place for many people. And if the discomfort of an endless sea of emptiness fills your mind with terror or with the quiet loneliness that eats away at the edge of your consciousness in the middle of the night, then click away. This video will be here when you're ready. But if you dare to brave the vast nothing, the great vacuum, the big empty, welcome. Let's go. When I say nothing, what image appears in your mind's eye? What flavor dances across your tongue? What sensation creeps up your spine or sparks between your organs? Emptiness? Darkness? Loneliness? Peacefulness? For many of us, the idea of nothing conjures the image of empty space. Whether it's the air in front of our faces or the vacuum of the cosmos, nothing is the empty space between things. But is that really nothing? Is the space between things really empty? The space between me and my camera may look empty, but in reality it's filled to the brim with chemicals, with atoms of all sizes and names, with energy in the form of heat as the breath from my mouth expels forth and pushes itself into the cocktail of gases already present. The space between planets is filled with light, with energy, with the push and pull of gravity. The space between atoms and between the parts of atoms and between the infinitely small parts of those parts is filled with electric fields and magnetism, constantly fighting to keep the fabric of matter together and apart in a never-ending battle of forces. Ancient Buddhists are thought to be the first to have a word for nothing, shunya. The Buddhists saw nothing as an important spiritual ideal, it's the state of non-self. It's the ability to see the world as it is without disturbance or distraction. The ancient Mesopotamians are credited with being the first to invent zero, though the Mayans weren't far behind, inventing it a full thousand years before the idea came to Europe. Both the Buddhist Shunya and the concept of zero indicate a lack of something, a lack of worry, a lack of self, a lack of a number. But if nothing is just a lack of something, then does that mean that for nothing to exist, something must also exist? Imagine for a moment that the Big Bang never happened. Not only was there no catalyst, but that infinitesimally small moat that contained all matter in the universe just didn't exist. Never existed. In this empty universe, there would be no some things to lack. There would just be nothing. There would be nothing without something ever having existed. Therefore, nothing cannot be defined as the lack of something. To have a lack of something, there has to be something to lack. But maybe this works in theory. In that empty universe filled with nothingness, where thingness never actually existed, one could still theorize about theoretical thingness existing there. In that universe, nothing could exist if there were some thing, even just in theory, to compare it to. Nothingness, then, seems to only exist if you have somethingness beside it. Negative space requires the presence of positive space. The void only exists in the area between objects. But now we're back to the spaces between, back to liminal spaces. The word liminal comes from the Latin word limen, which means threshold, and in psychology it describes the line between what we can perceive and what escapes our notice, what is subliminal. But just because we cannot perceive something doesn't mean that thing doesn't exist, if a tree falls in a forest and all that. Our liminal perceptions, those things we see and feel that we can only see and feel in fleeting moments, at the edge of sleep or out of the corner of our eye, they are real. 
Real enough to elicit a response. Real enough to send electrical impulses through the folds of our brains. That's not nothing. But if all it takes to make something a thing is to have it affect our minds, then does that mean thinking about nothing makes it something? When I asked you to visualize nothing, to close your eyes and sense how it made you feel, did nothing through some kind of internet-mediated alchemy get transformed into a thought? Transformed from an abstract eternal conundrum, a question vexing experts and philosophers and children, into electrical currents in your synapses, in your nerves, by my voice alone? If our minds can turn nothing into a thing, what does that mean for us? For the capabilities of our brains? Does the concept of nothingness grant us the power of creation? These are questions that don't have answers. Not yet, at least. Our knowledge of the existence of nothingness has shined a light on the void, and the void has consumed that light and offered no answers. For many people, Nothing is terrifying. It represents everything that could be, but is not. It is the forever that came before, and the even greater forever that will come after. No light, no air, no earth, no warmth, no sound, no thought, no life, no love. Nothing. But nothing isn't evil, and it shouldn't be frightening. In fact, to me, nothing, that indefinable, infinite void that exists somewhere out there, is comforting. The void represents the spaces between parts of reality. It's a place where the universe, the world, society, and me don't exist. It's dark and unknown and endless, and yes, that can be overwhelming, but it's also soft and warm. It's like a blanket made of thick black velvet that smells like lilac and old books. When it wraps around you, it squeezes like a hug from your favorite grandparent and lingers just long enough for you to know you are loved. It's deep and tangled and alluring like a cave in the woods or an abandoned factory. Curiosity pushes you in and everything is dark and still and the air smells like wet wood and your eyes are on everything that you're too afraid to touch because it could break the spell of a place that should not be. And maybe you'll find a treasure, or bones, or nothing at all. Or a story you could keep to yourself, locked away in the part of your memory reserved for solitude. You know you could go in deeper, see more, find more dust, and maybe you will, when you come back. If you come back. The void is constant. It's always there. It's the lining of the fabric of reality, and if you just pull back the curtain, you can see it under everything, between everything, always there. And it's comforting. It's comforting to know that emptiness and solitude and warm, quiet darkness are always there, away from the loud, bright, busy world that exhausts me down to my bones. Nothing is the space between things, and that is where I want to be. I want to exist in the liminal spaces, in the corners of eyes, in the fleeting sounds you think you hear from across the house in the middle of the night. I want my words and my actions to be real and be felt by real people, but when they look for the source, they don't see me. I want to be invisible and unknown, but I also want to be comforting and warm. I want my words to be soft, like a blanket. I want to smell like lilac and old books. I want to write poems that feel like hugs. I want to be deep and tangled and alluring. I want you to be curious enough to find me, but I want to be precious enough to be untouchable. I want my stories to become your stories. And above all, I want to be constant. I want to always be there. Maybe not me, but the ghost of me, the shell of me, the golem made of all my creations. 
Because maybe nothing, the void, isn't just emptiness. Maybe it's where we go when we fall asleep. Maybe it's where all our forgotten keys and socks lost in the wash end up. Maybe it's where our minds go during highway hypnosis, when we drive the same drive we've driven for years and we somehow make that drive without any memory of doing it. Nothingness is endless. It stretches on forever and ever, on and on until the end of time, and then on past that, too. But it's not a hole at the bottom of reality, or a vacuum in space waiting to swallow all of existence. Nothing, dear intergalactic trans-celebrity Juliet Mylan, is something else entirely. It's a room with dark wood walls and a floor covered in well-worn rugs. In the corner, a dimly lit Christmas tree pours red and green over someone's work boots. You notice the air has a musty wetness, like lots of old rooms and old houses. Like your grandparents' house. Yes, it, it smells distinctly like your grandparents' house. Like cool Oregon air and acres of grassland baking in the summer sun and... and cows. The couch, you must have missed it before, sits in the middle of the room. The graying leather fades along creases, and years stained whiteness pools on the left cushion. That was your spot when you and your brother played. <sighs> oh, you forget the name now. How long has it been since you've seen him? You forget. How did you get here? You don't remember coming into this house. You don't even know if this room is even in a house. How did you get here? The cold, open air of the outside feels a thousand miles away. You hear a coyote howl somewhere in the distance. How did you get here? A television in the corner blinks on. An old CRT, just static. How did you get here? It doesn't matter. The door is unlocked there, behind you. It's ajar, but you can't quite see through to the other side. You can leave whenever you want. Do you? Today's video was brought to you by all of my wonderful patrons whose names you should see scrolling on the screen here. And I want to give an especially huge thank you to Zauber, Sigwa, A Tasty Snack, Comrade Fox, Robert Bradford, Jameson Huddle, Mohammed Al Sabah, Dylan, Merritt Grames, and Adam. And if you would like to join these wonderful people, then come check out my Patreon, which I have linked in the description, and you can get lots of cool stuff like getting videos early, having poems written for you, and getting access to polls and our Discord server. So if that sounds like something that you would like to do to support the channel, then come on over. You can also support the channel by liking, commenting, subscribing, ringing the bell to make sure you get notified when I upload a video, and by sharing this video with anyone who you think needs a little extra existential dread in their lives. And until next time, stay safe, stay warm, and I will see y'all again soon, I hope. Bye, folks.